in their in, around their homes and what they think in their head is that why don't i kill this animal because this is my home yeah exactly and you know you've just said it exactly it's related to our changing values um this week my brother was in kisumu and some people killed a huge python mm. a 15 foot python yeah. why because they just felt they had to kill it mm -hmm. they didn't know it's a harmless animal it can't hurt a person mm -hmm. um, so we do have to educate people but a part of our education must be to revive our traditional knowledge mm -hmm. there are tribes in Kenya who revere snakes they don't kill snakes yeah. because snakes actually play a very key role in our ecosystems mm -hmm. when you kill snakes the rats and mice multiply mm. and they are the cause of so many diseases and they eat our grains and so we end up with even more problems at another level i'd like you to repeat that because i'm so sure not most of us are aware of how important snakes yes. are, are in that capacity that's it and this is what we have seen all over kenya where people see a snake the first thing they do is kill it yeah. and then maybe they might even try to find out what kind of a snake was it mm -hmm. but we most of our snakes are not dangerous to people and most snakes even if they're venomous they will ignore you mm. you just leave them alone mm. but in most parts of Kenya people will kill snakes mm. and as a result some areas we have lost all of our snakes mm -hmm. snakes eat rats and mice so if there are rats and mice in your farm in your home uh, snakes have disappeared those animals will multiply mm -hmm. and we have seen farms which are failing completely because the rats and mice are eating all the grains all the maize all the wheat all the rice mm -hmm. they will eat it all wow um, and that's because there are no predators for those snakes mm -hmm. you know in other countries they have come up with solutions bringing wildlife back to provide what we call ecosystem services okay in Italy and Spain they are putting up boxes to allow bats to come back mm -hmm. so the bats can eat the insect pests because one bat can eat a thousand insects in a night mm. and in doing so it prevents you from having to put so much pesticide on your crops okay. imagine if we use this traditional knowledge in africa especially here in kenya our local people our uh, our elders they know this i've been into the loiter forest i've spoken with the elders and they've told me so much more than any scientist could tell me mm -hmm because it's ancient knowledge passed down by generation by generation and we're losing it because it's not in our education system yeah, yeah. and that's where I think we need to bring it back we need I believe we need to have free entry to all national parks for all children no question when was the last time you went to a national park <laughs> Doreen <laughs> when I was in high school you see so Most now, that, Kenyans, is, that is what it means when actually you're saying it needs to go back down to the yes. culture to our roots because i mean back then when in primary it was it was a norm in on a has yeah. it was a norm you you would even feel the excitement well, i can tell there. you today most schools are not going to the national parks uh -huh. most schools are not going to the national parks so part of it is the cost okay. we have created barriers for children to go to our national parks okay. i think we should have free entry all children to our national parks i want the president to do this mm. a gift for all our children so that we develop this love for nature and then we focus on teachers let's train our teachers how to bring classes to the national park you can do languages in the national parks you can do mathematics you can do english composition you can do art and you can do sciences you can do geography you can do every lesson you can imagine inside a national park and wouldn't that be perfect for the cbc system it's that's exactly what it should be doing right um, so part of what I'm thinking is that we need to bring wildlife into our classrooms and in the form of our coursework and bring our children into our national parks okay. so that learning from nature becomes the norm because it's natural. <laughs> it's actually how we evolved. We learn from nature. We, as children, you've seen children are always watching things out in the environment. It's very natural okay. and it's once you get connected to nature, you can't disconnect mm. it becomes permanent mm. whether you become a banker an insurance agent a doctor whatever you will always love nature if you're introduced to it when you're a child wow now that makes a lot of sense also just trying to tie it with what you're saying when you're beginning culture traditions now this yes. is why it all makes sense now try to better understand that all right
Also, again, you had mentioned one of your TED Talks that development does not need to destroy wildlife. And sometimes we do not get the analogy because we would tend to think, and I think this is just for also most of us as Kenya, especially here in Nairobi, that I want to build a house in this place. I want to construct something here. So what is the whole point of having perhaps a national park just around the city or something of the sort? And we don't at times get the importance of that. Make us understand just that particular statement. You know, um, if you go to Karura Forest, yeah. How do you feel when you're in the forest? In fact, I was just there the other Saturday, and it feels so nice. It just feels the, you know, the ambience and the nature. No? Very beautiful. Our brains are hardwired uh -huh. to feel relaxed in nature. Yeah. Because that's how we evolved. If we are in the trees, without knowing it, you are inhaling some of the pheromones or chemicals from the trees. Mm -hmm. They calm you down. Mm -hmm. They release stress. Mm -hmm. The sounds you're listening to, you may not be conscious, but actually the sounds of nature are so important that people actually make money recording sounds of nature and selling it on the internet mm -hmm. for people who live in cities yeah. who can't sleep at night and they just wear headphones to listen to the birds, the insects, mm -hmm. the leaves, the rivers. So, so imagine we have this, even here in the city of Nairobi, yeah. we have parks, we have forests, we have streams. If you go to Ololua Forest, it's unbelievable. Yeah. But we're destroying it because we haven't appreciated it and we tend to appreciate things which have concrete and cash yeah. associated with them. And I think we need to change our whole understanding and comprehension of nature. If you go to Chulu Hills, we have this fantastic series of beautiful mountains covered in forest. It's called a cloud forest. That forest attracts clouds and the forest depends on clouds. Mm -hmm. If you cut the forest down, it, the whole system will break down. Mm -hmm. That forest absorbs moisture from the clouds. It seeps down. It comes up in Mazima Springs. Mm -hmm. And that is the source of water for the entire city of Mombasa. If you destroy the forest, Mombasa will have no water. Mm -hmm. That's how important nature is. Do the people in Mombasa pay for the protection of Chulu Hills? No. But that forest alone, in terms of carbon, from a Western perspective, is worth about $10 million per year. $10 million for a forest. Now imagine if we were to put that kind of assessment on all our forests, all our nature. If you wanted to build a road through Chulu Hills, you'll have to now account for the cost you're going to incur to our country because you're destroying forests, destroying water, destroying the carbon sequestration. Also, there's the biodiversity. We tend not to do that. We put railways across the national park without thinking what is the impact of that railway actually on all the biodiversity, ecosystem services, and on us and our psyche. Mm -hmm. If you go to Narebi National Park and you stand there and you see this huge concrete thing across the park, yeah. you feel it inside you viscerally. Mm -hmm. It's wrong. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be there. Okay. So these are the things that we need to get, you know, get close to. Um, I fear that uh, while we do need development, development should not be destroying the environment yeah. because that is the source of life of our people, oh, oh, oh. the soil, the water, our air. Yeah. We can't do without food. We can't do without clean water. And we can't do without clean air. We can't survive. Um, so if development is impacting on that, then that development is not sustainable. Yeah. And Kenya has made a commitment that we will be a country that only supports sustainable development. Mm -hmm. So therefore, as citizens, as people, as leaders in the country, mm -hmm. we must stand up for sustainable development. Okay. Right now, let's talk talk about the program Wildlife Warriors beginning this Saturday from 6.30 p.m. Tell us more about that program and what Kenyans should expect. So this is our show wildlife mm -hmm. warriors um, wildlife warriors is a tv series inspired by the fact that most of our wildlife stories have been told by westerners from their western perspective for international audiences not for domestic audiences mm -hmm. and we feel education and inspiration is so important why do people in america love elephants mm -hmm. and lions it's because they've been watching documentaries made in our country mm -hmm. so when we tried to bring those films to Kenya, we were told we have to pay a lot of money to bring the films back to Kenya. So we decided, you know what, let's just make our own films. Mm -hmm. And we've started making wildlife documentaries. We are the first African crew in the entire continent to be making wildlife documentaries. 
That is how much uh, failure has been in the system for decades. So this series shines a light on those amazing heroes and heroines who are at the front line across Kenya. So far we've only filmed in Kenya. People working on whales, wild dogs, lions, leopards, elephants, rhinos and many other species. And what we want to show is that we have this in these incredible and inspiring young people oh. doing world-class research or conservation that can inspire children and young people in Kenya to want to become conservationists. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be a scientist like me. Mm -hmm. You could be an engineer or an artist or a business person. You're still able to do wildlife conservation. Or a journalist. Or a journalist, <laughs> of course, <laughs> filmmakers. You know, yeah. so, so it's very exciting. The impact of our series has been enormous. The heroes on the ground are very excited. Mm -hmm. And now we... Um, are getting requests from other countries they want us to come and film in other countries across Africa as okay. well. Okay, You just mentioned that this is the first film of its kind and I'm really interested and I'm so sure most Kenyans would be I mean what would it why would it take us so long to just think of doing such kind of a thing? I think that it stems from the fact that our national parks have been promoted primarily for international markets, okay. for tourists. Yeah. And many Kenyans uh -huh. see wildlife as something to bring tourists. We've done surveys in schools across Kenya. Mm -hmm. Children tell us wildlife is good because it brings foreign revenue. Mm -hmm. Not wildlife is good because I love it, mm -hmm. because I enjoy seeing it, because, um, you know, I feel good when I'm out there in the forest. Mm -hmm. They say it's good because foreigners come to Kenya. Mm. It's time we take it back. We, we need to own our wildlife. We need to cherish our wildlife okay. ourselves. We need to own and cherish our wildlife ourselves. Better said. As we conclude, Dr. Tari, let's just talk a bit about the impact that this program is going to have on our viewers. As you were just coming up with it, what were you envisioning? When we started making this series, we envisioned uh, audiences discovering our animals for the first time. Okay. So how many Kenyans knew we have humpback whales in Kenyan waters? Mm -hmm. Nobody knew this. When we filmed in Watamu, people asked us, which country are you in? As here in Kenya. People when, asking you that? Which country are you in? Mazima Springs. They've never seen anything like it. So you can imagine, we are introducing Kenyans to these amazing places in the country. And we've seen Kenyans going to the national parks that's what we wanted. Mm -hmm. Go and see the marine parks. Go to the Savos. Go to the Chulu Hills. Go to Meru, Mount Kenya, Abadez. Go and enjoy these places because they are ours. Mm -hmm. It's actually not expensive. As a Kenyan citizen, it only costs you 350 shillings to go to a national park. Mm -hmm. And so for us, it's not expensive and we should be enjoying it. It's a, going to the national parks is um, really mind-blowing. It will change people's hearts and minds mm. completely oh, wow but we didn't realize that the series would also impact on the people we are filming so some of our heroes have now gotten PhDs they have gotten grants equipment has been donated mm -hmm. there many of them are featuring in international films so we we have actually catalyzed interest in not only in filmmaking but in the actual heroes that we've been featuring so this is really exciting there's a lot more attention and our goal now is to create africa's first wildlife film school for african wildlife filmmakers that's beautiful so this is really exciting i think we have come at the right time and there's a lot of interest in doing this so we will be having many more programs, not from Wildlife Direct, <laughs> from many other filmmakers. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to see a lot more wildlife documentaries being made in this country. Okay. So also what I'm getting from, from you is that it's more of sort of like trying to also create awareness to Kenyans to try and know that these places actually exist and they're not as expensive as how we would think. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And that, uh, you know, the way that we go out to the malls or we go to the cinema, we spend money on all kinds of things. Investing in going to the national parks is also supporting the Kenya Wildlife Service. It supports the whole sector to, prom to protect wildlife, especially because of COVID. Yeah. There have not been very many international tourists. Mm -hmm. Kenyans should be flocking to those protected areas. Mm -hmm. The wildebeest migration is about to start. We should be having thousands of Kenyans going down to the Maasai Mara because it's, it's a, a, a symbol and it's also a signal to our wildlife people who are protecting land 
that we value it, mm -hmm. that we are coming ourselves. It doesn't have to be foreigners. We are coming ourselves yeah. to enjoy it. Kenya has 160 community-owned protected areas. Mm -hmm. 160. That is many times more than the number of national parks. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to go to a park. You can go to a conservancy. You know, there are many in the Masai Mara area, many around the Amboseli, up in like Kipia. There are so many conservancies. Mm -hmm. And visiting any of them, I think, will excite anyone. But I would love to throw out a challenge mm -hmm. to all Kenyans. Uh -huh. How many protected areas can you visit in a year? Forests, sanctuaries, parks, marine parks, reserves, conservancies. Let's, let's have a challenge. Let's give everyone a chance to go and, okay. uh, and record how yeah. many places they can go yeah. to as a, as a way of saying, I love Kenya. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Ari. And also for that challenge, we take it as Kenyans. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Paula Kahoo, but at least for shedding light and making us understand also what we can do as a community to just conserve our wildlife. And as, as um, uh, we just take this uh, pr uh, break, I want to leave you with the promo of this program, Wildlife, um, that is Wildlife Warriors, beginning this Saturday at 6.30. Take a look.